This is Under the Lens, featuring economic research by Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. The content of this presentation is strictly the opinion of Gordon T. Long and is based on facts he feels to be accurate as a result of his research at this time. All listeners are advised to independently verify all research for market changes. The following opinions are not in any way a solicitation for business, nor should they be considered investment advice. You should always consult a registered investment advisor before making investment decisions. Now, let's join Gordon for today's show. Good morning. It is Wednesday, August the 24th, 2016. I'm Gord Long at GordonTLong.com. As is normally the case, I have a lot of charts for us to go through this morning, so therefore I will pass over some of them quickly, but leave you to examine them further at your leisure. You'll need to open your viewer to full screen viewing or you'll not be able to see some of the detail I'll be discussing. A reminder before we begin, do not trade from any of these slides. They are for educational and discussion purposes only. The purpose of the audio is to discuss key developments in those areas not specifically updated in this month's Global Macro Tipping Points Research Report document. The research document this month updates the global risk outlook. Therefore, the slides this morning will focus on the other three report areas of the GMTP report, the global macro, regional, and U.S. economic developments. As I often do, I'd like to tie them together into a discussion on how financial repression is relentlessly advancing. In this regard, I'd like to cover the following subject areas. I normally keep the slides discussed in the monthly market analytics and technical analysis report, or the MATA report, separate from those discussed in the Global Macro Tipping Points report. This month, however, I'd like to take what I recently released in the MATA report and take it further. This month, I would like to discuss how the financial markets, and specifically the U.S. equity markets, are in fact no longer acting as markets, as we understand the term. Since a large concentration of total financial assets value is dependent on the equity and bond markets, it has now become critically important to maintain the market values at almost any cost. The market has become too systemically important to allow it to fail. Unknowingly, unwittingly, or possibly as a calculated strategy, policymakers have changed the function of the market. The market left on its own devices is a consequence of the underlying economy. Today, however, the market is being used as a false portrayal of the underlying economy. It is intentionally using the logical fallacy of confusing cause and effect. Using a house thermostat as a metaphor, the thermostat is no longer meant to reflect the temperature inside the house. It is only used to convince you the house is in fact warm. If true, that means policies are being targeted at manipulating the thermostat rather than keeping the furnace hot. The consequences is a spiraling of resource misallocation, furthering the structural breakdown of economic activity, making it ever more important to keep the market looking strong. It is in fact a self-reinforcing trap once begun. When we took markets off price to market during the financial crisis and accelerated releveraging, the cast was poured. The real new normal is what is beginning to be referred to as the Ponzi narrative. Just as there's a scheme to pay old investors with new investor money that is in a Ponzi scheme, there's another part of the scheme that rarely gets talked about, i.e. the narrative that fuels the scheme to begin with. Much like the original structure, which involves money, this too needs an ever-growing amount of gullible, willing participants. However, the currency here is narrative. And just like any Ponzi scheme, once you lose the narrative, you've lost everything. One cannot survive without the other. Yet it is the narrative, more often than not, that is needed to drive the scheme ever higher. Without it, the scheme implodes by its own weight. The narrative, regardless of how outlandish, bizarre, or full of nothing but outright lies, must be maintained and vociferously defended by those who are already caught in the scheme. In my view, the reason for the greatest confusion, as well as the complete consternation, is this. Too many are forgetting the investors in this scheme are governments or proxies with unlimited funding resources as well as they also control the narrative, i.e. any data point they wish to convey as what is good or bad. Why the scheme 
of today is far more troubling than those of bygone era is, as I reiterated, the access to unlimited funds. These games can be played for a while, and as we have witnessed, can actually go on for much longer than we would believe. However, as we would expect, the longer they do, the bigger the problem created. The fallout is more damaging when the inevitable adjustment comes. What it does to the social fabric, motivations and expectations of a generation of people who have known nothing else is equally as serious in fixing the problem. Alan Greenspan, who put us on this road, has been pounding the table recently saying that falling savings is hindering the investments in productive assets which results in slowing productivity gains and an inevitable decrease in the standard of living. He is absolutely right but rather than point the finger at the tapped out middle class, he needs to realize that corporate profits, which are also savings, are at record levels. The corporations, however, are not investing because they can't see the risk-adjusted growth returns. Where they do see them is in foreign labor arbitrage investing or mergers and acquisitions where they can strip out labor costs. Effectively, we have created a system that is killing the golden goose. The Golden Goose is a vibrant middle class and an aspiring lower class. I refer you to my recent May report on the failing social contract. Let's look at the relationship between market levels and productive growth in the United States. As you can see in this chart, when we have had market drawdowns in the past, the markets corrected on a relative basis to productivity growth, shown here in red. The problem now is that a correction is simply too great for the system to handle. The fallout and contagion could potentially be devastating. The point of natural support is just as the chart shows, way too low. As I've written before, central banks can solve liquidity problems. They can't, however, solve solvency problems, nor can they solve falling productivity. But these aren't the only growing problems the central banks just simply cannot solve, and they're getting larger. Central banks can make liquidity and potential lending available, but they can't force lenders to lend, nor borrowers to take on more debt and credit. What we presently see in Chimerica is that the credit growth rate is no longer sufficient to power global expansion and the associated trade it fosters. Additionally, the markets are considered severely overvalued and investors are steadily leaving the markets. Markets normally correct when this begins to occur, never after it has been occurring for a pronounced period of time. It just doesn't get to this point, but it has. So the question is, if the central bankers can't fix this problem, then what is holding up the markets and asset prices? Who is buying? The short answer is the central banks, government treasury entities, and sovereign wealth funds. As I've pointed out in previous reports, the central bankers of the EU, Japan, and UK alone are now injecting approximately $200 billion per month. This is well over twice the peak crisis level of QE3. The central bankers of the fiat currency cartel have adopted the Bernanke doctrine of enrich thy neighbor by sequentially implementing policies of increasing liquidity. This was a doctrine that he outlined when he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, but we really didn't see it as clearly as it is now. You can expect the U.S. after the U.S. election to once again be aggressive in the growth of the central bank assets and increasing liquidity. The United States will soon be once again up to bat. It is working, at least temporarily, and abruptly stopped the 2016 year beginning market sell-off, if you recall. Not only was the market selling off in early 2016, but the markets from a technical perspective, which we have laid out in the MATA report, had reached critical inflection points. Indications were that either the markets broke higher or collapsed. The central bankers had to react for this reason and, of course, the potential of a global recession, which was looming, it appeared. The markets are now being artificially held up, obviously. They are on life support, which cannot be withdrawn. Let's explore the buying of the U.S. stock market by the Swiss National Bank, which recently surfaced. What would prompt the troubled Swiss National Bank to buy $60 billion in U.S. equities? This is a bank that has had endless financial issues trying to control a Swiss franc peg to the euro. It makes little sense on the surface unless they are a proxy through a swaps agreement with the U.S. Treasury or the Federal Reserve. 
What I find particularly troublesome is they are focused on stocks which have an inordinate amount of leverage on the U.S. stock indices. I am sure this is only a coincidence. They are buying what is called the Fab Five, not five technology leaders, which are now dominating the indices. And by the way, do not relate to earnings, real earnings, gap earnings. Consider the Bank of Japan's buying of the Nikkei. The Bank of Japan now owns 60% of the nation's ETF market as of June 2016. As if this isn't enough, the Bank of Japan has authorized further buying following the recent announcement by the Bank of Japan that it would double its ETF purchases to 6 trillion yen or 58 billion up from the current 3.3 trillion which is the yen which is equivalent to the Fed purchasing 580 billion in ETFs over the next two years according to at least Bloomberg's analysis. 580 billion in ETFs? It's amazing the, ETF, the Japanese stock market isn't going completely through the moon. Presently, the Bank of Japan is already in the top five owners of 81 of those Nikkei 225. The Bank of Japan will be the number one holder of 55 of the Nikkei 225 by year-end this year. Others like the CLSA's Nicholas Smith write that, and I quote, the BOJ is nationalizing the stock market, end quote. And I agree with him, because that is precisely what it is doing with every incremental intervention in the stock market. Like the issue that has especially plagued bond buyers in Europe over the past few months, the analyst writes that, and I quote, that as long as the Bank of Japan continue to buy ETFs, the Japanese market's performance would become increasingly a function of liquidity in the central bank's buying basket. Considering that the Bank of Japan will have to interfere far more aggressively in both the bond and stock market in the coming months to push the yen weaker, liquidity is only set to get worse. What is possibly going on here other than central banks have resorted to taking on any measures possible to keep the markets up? The elimination of the price discovery function leads to lost buying opportunities for investors and ultimately weakens the investment appetite. This is potentially a serious error for the Bank of Japan. Some liken the increased purchases by the Bank of Japan, the only central bank in the world that buys stocks at the moment other than the, the Swiss National Bank, uh, at least as went public, to failed government efforts over more than two decades to prop up the market by pressing government-related financial institutions to buy after the bursting of the late 1980s asset bubble. My friend Miss Shedlock reports that things are so absurd in the Eurozone that the ECB is now buying private placement debt with little regard to safety and in turn private equity companies issue debt simply because they know in advance, the ECB will buy it. It is a startling example of how the market is adapting to extremes of monetary policy, and it's a safe conclusion the experiment will not end well. For now, it's a seller's paradise as companies build bonds for European central banks to buy. Continuing for what Mish is saying, the ECB only announces what it will buy, not how much it, of it. Yet that has spawned a guessing game driving yields lower and lower. As soon as the ECB does buy an issue, the interest rates on those bonds collapse, and now we see private placement of debt specifically designed with the ECB in mind. Quantitative easing is supposed to spur lending and investment. In practice, it's killing the pension plans while fostering bond bubbles. As long as the companies do not default, the ECB can simply hold the debt to term, just as the Fed is doing now. Meanwhile, the bubbles continue to inflate. Can they succeed? Yes, they can, but the world and how people are governed will necessarily change. For example, these distortions cannot be hidden from actual government tax receipts. Tax receipts are falling as the economy continues to deteriorate. How does a government sustain payment for increasing debt levels with tax revenues falling? And, and, and I saw this quote, and here's the statistics. Receipts from the Federal Unemployment Tax Act, that's called FUDA, have been following steadily since 2012, according to the Office of Management and Budgets, moving counter to the growing number of people employed. The FUDA tax is levied at 6% on the first 7,000 of employees' wage, and that's out of CNBC. There you have it. Since 2012, unemployment tax receipts have been falling. 
if the U.S. economy has indeed been creating jobs, this number should be rising. Why is this number falling? Particularly when the unemployment number is supposed to be, or is supposedly, below 5% and job growth is great. There are a couple of answers to that question and neither is favorable. The BLS numbers are either wrong or the quality of new jobs created must be very poor. The latter response seems the most credible, a combination of an increase in the proportion of part-time workers and full-time jobs that provide lower compensation. The recovery narrative is a myth and unemployment numbers have become a political propaganda tool and has no reflection on the U.S. economic realities. It's another part as I started with the Ponzi scheme of controlling the narrative. To keep this gig going, the governments are going to have to become more socialist and totalitarian at the same time. It would appear the only way out without a major crisis, the likes of which the world has likely never seen. To keep the system from imploding, rates must continue to fall to allow massive and increasing government debts to be funded. We expect a slight uptick, however, in rates going into 2017, which will actually allow trillions of dollars of government fiscal infrastructure investment to be financed at a very attractive rate, but it will only be temporary to buy more time. My associate Richard Duncan tries to explain what is really going on here, but few seem to support him. I think he is actually closer than most suspect to what is actually going on. He feels global quantitative easing is now cancelling half a trillion dollars of government debt per quarter. The And I'll quote um, a note that Richard just put out recently because I think the statistics he lays out are quite convincing. The UK Central Bank announced that it will print 70 billion pounds between now and March 2017. It will use 60,000 pounds of that new money to buy UK government bonds, effectively cancelling a further 60 billion of UK government debt. That will increase the amount of UK government debt effectively cancelled by the Bank of England from 375 billion pounds to 435 billion pounds. Together, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan are now printing the equivalent of U.S. $500 billion every three months and using that new money to effectively cancel nearly $500 billion of government debt per quarter. In total, those three banks plus the Fed have effectively canceled roughly $8 trillion of government debt that way thus far. That amount seems unbelievably large, but the facts are undeniable. The Bank of England has canceled 25% of all U.S. government debt, the Bank of Japan 35%, the ECB 12%, and the Fed effectively 13% of all U.S. government debt. In addition to the U.S. $8 trillion of government debt that has been canceled by these four central banks thus far, another $1 trillion is scheduled to be canceled over the next six months. If the Bank of Japan and ECB continue acquiring debt at the current rate, they could acquire and effectively cancel all the Japanese and European government debt currently in existence in approximately nine years. It would take the Bank of England 13 years. The central bank's bond buying programs have driven interest rates down to the lowest levels in history. Roughly U.S. $13 trillion worth of bonds are traded at negative rates or negative yield. This quantitative induced collapse in borrowing costs has set the stage for the next phase of the government policy response to the global economic crisis. Again, according to Richard Duncan, and I quote, fiscal austerity is about to give way to fiscal stimulus. Since the central banks have already canceled so much government debt, the true level of government debt is much lower than is generally understood. That fact completely changes the policy options and opportunities open to our societies. It means our governments can actually afford to borrow and spend much more. He believes that is exactly what they're going to do. He expects a large-scale, global, coordinated fiscal stimulus program to be announced right after the elections, fall elections, and in early 2017. If it is carried out aggressively enough, it will, and according to Richard, put an end to the economic crisis that began in 2008. That is in question, but he believes strongly that would be the case. If it isn't, he also believes the global economy is in danger of collapse because monetary policy is nearly exhausted. 
All of this to me suggests that with the credit cycle turning, that a Minsky melt-up may lie very close ahead, or in fact we may be in the midst of it right now, before we see a final and inevitable fiat currency collapse, which we've been calling for since the dot-com bubble imploded and the action taken then and set us on this course. It is coming, but it still may be possibly a year away. Never underestimate what governments and central bankers will do to stay in power. In closing, remember the answer will be print more money. It is the only answer politicians will ever agree on. Invest accordingly. In closing, I'd like to take a moment as a reminder, do not trade for many of these slides. They are for educational and discussion purposes only. As negative as these comments often are, there has seldom been a better time for investing. However, it requires careful analysis and not following what has traditionally been the true and tried approaches. Do your reading and make sure you have a knowledgeable and well-informed financial advisor. So until we talk again, may 2016 turn out to be an outstanding investment for you and your family. Thank you for listening. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.